Cool. Well, thanks for coming. Um, so the, the big part of this was starting it off was, was trying to create a, a place and a space for an exchange of value. So everyone at this table has a very unique skill set. That's why I try to tailor the questions to that, to give you that opportunity. So this is what this is about, really, because my, my job and my role is what I'm a financial advisor. But I realized that there was a lot of business owners that didn't have an exit strategy with their business, and KiwiSaver didn't make a whole lot of sense for them. So I figure, if I can add value to business owners, what's the best way to do that? Well, create, and create a platform where you can all meet, share ideas, and grow collectively, and then also add value as well from the keynote speakers. So today is about selling, and in three weeks we're gonna do uh, social media marketing, and also the future of voice, so how to leverage your voice, because uh, it's an emerging technology. So just with regards to that, this clipboard, um, the idea is I send out a weekly newsletter, uh, and also it talks about finance specifically, but I'm also gonna record these events. So if you think this is valuable and you wanna share it with, well, remind yourself or share it with your sales staff, then you can, or you can show them this is not what you don't wanna do. Either or, however this presentation goes, because I get a bit nervous and stuttery. But if you, if you were open to that, by all means, put, just put your name, your email. Um, you can put your mobile if you like, because we're thinking of actually sending that out as an update via text, because emails don't have a high open rate. So if you go by text and they click it and it goes direct there, it makes a lot of sense. So I'll just pass it around. It's got a pen at the top. So the whole point of running this sort of sales talk is that I, I realize there's a number of issues with the sales industry currently. So where it emerged from is I've done a lot of different jobs in terms of selling and managing a team of 15, and I realized a lot of it was script. So how many of you have had a call late at night perfectly in timed, and they've asked you, uh, oh, hi, how are you, and not even cared, and then just carried on and kept talking? Anyone had that experience? Yeah. So it's quite, a, it's quite a common thing, it's, it's on autopilot, they've said it so many times that they've lost the passion for it. <laughs> You're laughing like you know, I suspect, yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the thing about that is how do we change that narrative and why would we want to? Because the good thing about having a script is that means your salespeople can stay in their little box and tick the compliance issues, but you also gotta make money as well. And you also wanna make sure the client's experience is ideal so that they come back and you have a high attrition rate, you don't have cancellations. Because quite often if, if they don't, if you don't have a pitch that brings in their values, what's important to them, effectively they buy on emotion but they don't stay on logic. Because what happens is they buy, you impulse them, but they don't have any sort of tangible sort of neurons clustered around that experience. So if you just say a pitch, and they don't link any emotions to it. So an emotion adds more neurons, makes it more of a solidified decision. And if you, if you don't do that, then it starts to fade. They don't remember why they brought, and that's when the logic parts comes in, or buyer's remorse, as you'd say. So that's why that narrative needs to change. Another reason is the consumers are getting a lot more aware and mistrusting as well. So you probably had your grandparents, they talk about your handshake meant something back then and they had a lot of trust and when someone said something, they did it. So collectively over time, that hasn't been the case. So when you're coming out to a new prospect and you're talking to them, they've already got that guard up. They're putting you in that bracket. So the first step is comfort. So a lot of people say rapport, which is important, but all rapport really means is giving, them, giving you the opportunity for them to listen to you. Because quite often, they've got all this noise, you've got to break out of it. So how do you break out of it? Well, one of the ways is authenticity. So you probably, you've probably seen enough news stories and journalists to realize that they're not that authentic and it's something about it rubs you the wrong way. Do people sort of get that feeling? So that, that's the reality that you have. The client already mistrusts you on some level, depending on where they came from. If it's a qualified referral from someone they trust, that's a bit different but you're already behind the eight ball. So how do you get around that and how do you build authenticity? So a big part of that is congruence. When I say congruence, what do people think of or what comes to mind? Congruence. 
Congruence. C O no C O N G R U E N C. So congruence might have been a word I just made up, but you might have to look it up later. You mean what you say? Exactly. Exactly. Words. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I was starting to doubt it for a second there. <laughs> so it's it's uh, words, thoughts, actions align is how I like to perceive it. So any time that you're interacting with someone, they're looking for subtle communications that contradict what you're saying. So right now I'm a bit restless, a bit nervous because I find people incredibly scary. And that's why I do selling. It makes complete sense. Um, but that, that's what people are looking for. So when you first meet them, they're looking for any subtle little reason not to trust you. So who do you think, with that in mind, who do you think would be the most important person that you need to sell the product to? If you want to be authentic and congruent. Yourself. 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 So if you're not in an industry where you can believe in the product that you're selling, then maybe you should think about changing industry because what you could potentially get is cognitive dissonance. The mask you wear in life, the reality of which you feel, they're in contradiction, that leads to unhappiness. So you probably want to think about changing industries. So the first person you need to sell to is yourself. Because you're not going to subtly create mannerisms that they're going to pick up on that's going to contradict your belief. Your belief is going to align. But even with that, over time, your belief and passion is going to dissipate. It's going to equalize. So you need to find a way to reinvigorate that. So a big part of what we do at our company is having a ongoing meetings that help facilitate and remind us of what we're doing for the client and what that means for their life. So it's important to reinvigorate that passion because people, people buy into what you're selling if you believe in it. So in an interaction, you may notice there's either a person reacting or there's a person creating the reaction. Usually how you can gauge that is something called mirroring. Has anyone heard of the word mirroring? Mirroring? Cool. What would you say mirroring is? Chelsea, I already know you. It's doing what the other person is doing. <laughs> Naturally or unnatural. Exactly. So effectively, there was a, a good little study they did this with this, is that they found that when someone gets into rapport with another person, they start simulating their body language. So this is quite similar, the leaning back, relax, so you guys must have had some good rapport at the start. <laughs> so there's a good indicator. So when people, you may start noticing like with your friends or your family that when you start getting an entrainment or you start getting close to them, you start talking like them in the same speed, walking in the same time. Have you ever noticed that you're just perfectly in sync at times with friends and it's just like you've always known each other your whole life? So if that's the case, if when someone suddenly gets in rapport and they connect, why don't we act as though we're in the position that we're already in rapport without knowing them. So that's where mirroring comes in. So don't be obvious, don't be breathing at the same time, saying but every time they say but. But the subtle way of which you move, the subtle way of which they communicate, you want to make it similar. And then they'll start liking you and they don't know why. And they don't notice, believe it or not. I'm pretty sure you guys weren't sitting here thinking, oh, this guy's leant back kind of like me. Yeah. yeah. So you don't quite notice. So. The idea is you start simulating or acting in the way in which they communicate. That's not being disingenuous. You're still being yourself. You're just showing empathy in the way of which they want to be communicated to. So mirroring is another way to build comfort. Another way they talk about an influence in the psychology of persuasion is that a person, if you go out of your way to show something about your product that isn't good or maybe something that's better about the competitor, so handicapping yourself in sorts, makes you more believable. So how they would do that, yeah, I'm looking at that, a bit of confusion. So what I mean by that is, so when you're, let's say you're a waiter and you're selling wine. You're, you're talking to the table, you start sharing these great ideas about the wine, and then they, they offer to, to choose the most expensive wine. And you say to them, actually, I don't think it's quite worth the price. This one here is an amazing wine and it's a lower price point. I think it's going to be a lot better for the table. But by all means, if you want the expensive one, you can. So what that means is what you says has more validity. That, that sort of combined two words there made no sense. But 
when, when, you, when you go out of your way to show something that handicaps you in some way, because they're expecting you, what, like what do you think a client will expect you to say about your product? Would, do you think they'll say it's bad? Do they think they'll expect you to talk about how awful and how great the competitors are? No, they wouldn't expect, not all the time, yeah. Maybe don't do it all the time as well. So that's a good way to navigate comfort and start making what you say believable. Because once again, they already don't trust you. This isn't 1940. They're already questioning you. They've already been bombarded at 7, 8 o'clock. They've already seen so many people that promise things and let them down. So you're, you're behind the eight ball. So this is a way for you to get around that. And the other thing you can do by being honest like that, you're actually creating an opportunity for them to express their honesty as well. So if you create a platform and an agreement where you're actually being honest and they're being honest, then you're actually going to get the real objection. So does everyone know what I mean by objection? And you've probably been taught the objection handle, which is agree, relate, show them why they're wrong, and then impulse them to the final solution. They probably say it in a nicer word, but that's the idea. So pretend to understand, change their mind, and then impulse them to do something now. So that person, they're gonna, they, they're gonna have re objections or resistance to making a buying decision. And more often than not, where most salesmen make the mistake is they start handling an objection that isn't the actual objection. So have you had that before where you started trying to explain to someone why they might be wrong or why this makes complete sense and it makes complete sense but they still don't say yes. Has anyone had that before? Cool. So that's the idea. You want to make sure, you want to air out the dirty laundry and you want to make sure that it is the truth. Because there's no point handling something. It's a waste of their time, your time, handling something that they don't actually believe in or even want to have a solution for. But, and also on that note, there's a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Raise your hands if you've heard of that before been around a little while. So has anyone ever won an argument with someone else where they actually agreed? All right, you got one, you're doing well, you got two. All right, nice. So the challenge you face is that person could be quite amicable and understanding, but in that book it talks about in an argument there's no right or wrong, there's just someone that feels wronged. So when you change someone's mind, they agree in the moment, but they're losing social face. They're losing a perception. They have to feel as though they lost, which isn't a nice feeling. I mean, there's probably times you've all had where you've actually lost, but you won't admit it because it's, it's not nice to admit, and then later you realize, but it's not a nice feeling. So we want to minimize that experience for the client. So how do you think you might be able to handle an objection without making them feel as though they're wrong? It's a tricky one. If anyone had to guess, you can't be wrong. Don't disagree with them. Don't disagree, yeah. I mean, then you never get, yeah. You never, dis, never cause an argument, never have a problem. The, the other thing, what's that? I was say, could you present an example where someone else may have said the same thing and then you've given them an example? And it's For sure. So that's, that's a great indirect way to navigate someone. So that, that's what I call staying emotionally relevant. Most people don't believe in what you say, but they'll believe what you say about someone else. So a third party example it's called. So if you, if you get to the point where they're arguing and you actually have a genuine third party example, I know of a guy that used to make it up and pretend to cry and yeah, don't do that, it's a bit of a problem. But have a genuine third party example and help navigate through that, they're gonna believe it more. Well, how many people here are business owners? Just out of curiosity, got one too. Okay, so have you ever had staff, staff members that would agree with you, not actually do something about it, but then when someone else said it, they actually did it and they believed it? Have you ever had that? Just, just because someone else said the exact same thing you've been saying for the last two years, they suddenly implement it. Yeah, so that's the, that's the benefit of a third party example. But even better than a third party example is to solve the objection before it becomes an objection. Is that confusing? Yes. Good honesty. Gracias, gracias. So 
With a pre-handling of an ejection, the idea is you start collecting information. So with structuring a sales pitch, you're solving a problem. So you need to get a deep understanding of that problem and then what's going to stop them from going with the solution. So when you start gathering that data, you realize, oh, this person's got a partner. Oh, this person uh, doesn't have a whole lot of money right now. Or oh, this person already has a competitor's product. So you're just re building rapport, building comfort, but you're taking notes in your head. Because what you can do then, you see the problem before it's a problem. So if their partner's not there, and they're the decision maker, funnily enough, 80% of consumer decisions are made by the woman, so don't make the mistake of, oh, the blokes there would be sweet, that's probably not gonna work well for you. You want both there. So now that they're, they're both there, or if it's just them on their own, you need to solve that problem before it becomes a problem. So you could use a third party example. You say, oh look, a lot of people are unsure sort of how to do things and they need a little bit of reassurance from the partner and we, we don't want them to get in trouble. I mean, I, I don't want you sleeping on the couch or anything like that. But it's really simple. We give you all the information, they explained it to the partner and there was an instance actually with a client where they weren't sure, but in the end they took the leap of faith and the partner was actually happy that they took the initiative. And then any sort of concerns they had, they just called me and asked. So ideally you want to have like a real example of that. I don't really get that too often because usually we make sure the partner's there. Um, but that's an example. And so once you've built comfort, the, there's a mistake we often make and they always talk about you have one mouth and two ears and we all say that. But in reality, how many of us are actively listening to the person? So most commonly your experience is people are thinking of what to say next or they're thinking what that means to them. So I've heard that called the already always listening voice. So it's going, they're talking, are you there? Like if they start giving you a problem, you're actually trying to solve a solution, but the solution was actually to listen to their problem. Like you, you probably had experience in your personal life where you're selling your you're really upset, you just want someone to listen to you and they start giving you advice. Who said that? Yeah, how annoying is that? Exactly, so sometimes the best thing you can do is actually listen. It sounds stupid, it sounds like everyone's doing it, but not many people do. And listening isn't just their words, it's like what are they not saying? What are their mannerisms conveying? How is their body language? Are they closed off? Are they open? Are they engaged? Are they asking questions? So it's really, nothing matters more than that person in front of you. You can multitask, supposedly, but that person's gonna feel that. Gonna feel that you're not here. So that's a big part, listen. The second part, so you got comfort, you built the comfort, you've done the mirroring, you've done the connecting, you've made them feel understood, and you understand the problems that are gonna come. So now, how do you stay emotionally relevant? That's the phrase I think is quite useful in selling is because that person may actually need you to be angry at them. That person may need you to be incredibly calm and non-threatening and small. You need to be emotionally relevant to what that person needs. I saw a few people cringe when I said angry. So I don't want you to just start screaming and slamming the desk, but if you think of the archetype of people, have you ever had someone you kindly and nicely ask them. Yeah, come on, get involved. We saved a seat for you. Uh, all, right, all good, mate. Um, I have no idea, what are we talking about? Anyone know? Emotionally all right, cool. Everyone's embodying the listening, I like it. So remaining emotionally relevant, this person you may have had when you're incredibly nice and you ask nicely over and over and over again and they don't execute until suddenly you just lose it and you say, can you do this? Can you clean that? And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. And they do it. Has anyone had that experience where it just took that little bit of edge to your voice and the, you got the outcome that you wanted? So it sounds counterintuitive. It sounds like you don't want to ex push your emotions on someone, but just think about the archetype they have. They could have had a very overbearing parent or they, they could have had an experience where they're really self-critical and they need 
a huge amount of positivity and support so they don't want you to be too angry or too imposing because it reminds them of that person that tripped them over when they were at school and now it's this whole thing in their head. So it's true. You need to be emotionally relevant to what that person needs. So, yes, that's a good question. So this is an EQ thing, so it's, it's effectively, it's a trial, it's a test and measure. So you start seeing patterns in people, and you try not to put them in a box, but you get a bit of an understanding. So, for example, when I would sell in a shopping center, I'd just stop people. There were some people, when I had a very strong, imposing body language, they would crumple up and be scared. So as soon as I saw that in their eyes, I would get small, and I'd replicate, oh, sorry, and then I'll say, oh, have you seen this? And break eye contact and let them come over. So you'll start seeing in their reaction, you'll have some people that don't like too much proximity. If you're too close, they'll clam up. So you just start learning those things. So if you're trying to set, train your sales people, every time that they interact with someone, ask them what that person was feeling or why do you think they said those things. What that starts to train is their focus on seeing it's relevant and then it builds their, their skill set. So it is a hard thing. And sometimes you'll get angry and they needed you to be supportive and it's quite dangerous, so maybe don't do angry if you're not sure yet. But sometimes the tonality is all they needed to get a yes. Answer the question? Cool. Could I add something to that Yeah, please do. This is Fiona, our Director of First Impressions and Amazing Saleswoman. Two miles and one year. Um, when you were talking about the listening, it is really important and it's a very old-fashioned skill that doesn't seem to be um, displayed very often. Something that I found that really, really helped was to um, light the mirror, but you're actually repeating what people have said to you. You've asked the questions and they've given you the answers, probably really long answers to a very short question. So you could say, so in, in summary or so, what we're talking about here is, is and just bullet point it back so then they know that they've heard you you know you've heard them correctly, and when you get to a point where they're still dithery, perhaps not so much the angry, but a very direct, well, we, we did go over this point, and do you remember that we said such and such and so and so? So you can actually bring them back to it in a very decisive way. So, you know, so you're being quite firm about it, not necessarily confrontational, but you can, you can actually sort of remind them that this is what you said this is what we agreed was, you know, in, in the words that are appropriate. So I can understand, sometimes you can go, oh yes, so many times, but then at some point, you have to say, well, this is what we're talking about, and this is what you said, and this is what I'm trying to help you to do. Fair. Would that? No, that's good, and, and I'm glad you clarified the distinction between anger and being firm. Yeah. I, I didn't mean for you to yell at them, but just have an edge or just potentially just calling it out. Because you know you're the expert, and that's why they're there, you know? Yeah, value your time. And there's, um, there's a book um, called The Challenger, and it, it talks about what salesmen had to do when the global financial crisis hit. So The Challenger, that's quite tricky. You imagine you're on Wall Street, and the products you sell have gone down by half. So someone put in 100 grand, and now it's worth 50,000. That's quite scary. The best thing you can do uh, from a financial advising standpoint is to have it diversified so they won't lose all their money, it's just down for a bit and then you've got to hold their hand, they get through it. But for a salesman, it's very hard with that perception and mistrust. So the style of salesman that was the most successful was the challenger, the person that had the direct conversations, that smoked out the rabbit, so to speak. Because there's one thing to build comfort and for you to connect with that person and be authentic, but if you've got something in your mind, they're not listening. They're doing the already listening voice to you. So somehow we've got to get them out of their head so they're on the moment. So it could be a specific event that they're worried about and you just say, look, it seems like there's something on your mind. What's, what's wrong? Or um, this is making complete sense. You've said this, you know this is going to work for you, what's stopping you? Sometimes the uncomfortable conversations are the most important and that's been a learning curve for me because I, I don't want people to feel bad, you know, I want them to have a good experience. But in my line of work, if I'm a financial advisor and if I don't have those serious conversations, that could lead to financial ruin. 
they're, they're thinking of putting all their money into this one thing, and I want to be supportive and make them feel good about themselves, but it's going to be the completely wrong thing. And I just have to tell them, look, you're wrong, or this is, this is incredibly dangerous. I do not want you to do this. So sometimes you kind of have to be cruel to be kind, or uncomfortable or firm to support them through it. So just, just think, don't be afraid, because you've got time. I mean, if you're a business owner, how many business owners have less than 10 employees? Raise your hand. Yeah, so you're, you're, pick, you're, you're effectively in your business. So the hardest thing is for you to think outside the business because you're constantly executing, you're involved in it, everything's going on. So it's very hard for you to have complete presence and focus on each client. So, and also, there's a lot of time wasters. You've probably heard of the, the, um, the phrase, the, the customer's always right. Who's heard that, yeah? I, I think there should be something called honest customer service. But from a selling perspective, if you've done it long enough, you realize buyers can actually be liars. So they're so worried about offending you or social pressure, they're like, yeah, I'll call you at this time, on this day, yes, thank you, uh, that was amazing. And then you never hear from them again and they fly to, I don't know, Iceland or something and they just disappeared off the face of the planet. People, people can, can, can lie. And sometimes all they needed was the opportunity to be honest. Where you say, look, there's something on your mind. You don't have to buy this product that's completely fine, but just be honest with me. I'm being honest with you. I have a limited time schedule. I'm talking to a lot of people. I'm here to help. What's holding you back? And that saves you so much time. It could be a 10-minute cons consultation instead of a two-hour conversation. They're happy. You're happy. So have those tough conversations. And so that's what it's about being emotionally relevant. The other thing is you start collecting all that data about who they are, what's important, their values, their goals, and you start linking it to your product. So whatever, what sort of products do people sell here? Um, oh yeah? What sort of businesses people have got? Yeah, I'm curious. What's We've got our IT service-based service business. IT service-based? Yeah, so we do have websites, mobile apps, and OK. What's the biggest reassurance that you give clients? Like, What do they really appreciate most about your service as opposed to doing Wix or Squarespace? Or? Um, I think it's, it's, the value. it's the value we have just through the constant communication and just through the skill set the developers have. OK, um, so ongoing service, yeah, ongoing support. Service. And the specialty skill set we have. Okay, and is that like the specialty skill set you have? Is that a consultancy as well, like helping direct them in innovation? Yes, or? yes, in that as well, yeah. Okay, so a big part of that selling would be understanding the direction of their business and what exactly. they want from it. Understanding what they actually want and understanding what. Um, if they were to build a website, why they're doing it and what value is it going to bring to them? To exactly. Because you, I see, I didn't listen that well. I started thinking about how nervous I am, and you might have felt a little bit of that. But that was a good demonstration. But the 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 idea, obviously, with this website is they have this direction they want it to be. They have this vision. It might be similar to you know you read a book and then you see the movie. So you're going to have that that challenge in trying to merge that that issue. So you want to really understand what's important about their business, what message they want to convey, and then really really linking that to your product. So uh, look, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of unknowns with technology, and you're so caught up in your business, you might not be able to see them for what they are. We're doing that for you, we're solving you that concern, and, and we're there all of the way, ongoing service. So that's, what, that's the linking part. So it's about understanding their needs, their values, what's important to them, and then aligning it with your product in an honest way. You don't have to lie about it. That was completely honest, that made complete sense. So once you start linking them, the other thing you've heard of is creating a sense of urgency. Have you heard that before? By now? So sure, you can put false time limits on if you're not there in person. Another way you can do it is commitment. So what people like to do is have an idea in their mind and find evidence to support the idea that they already have. So they're just trying to reconfirm what they already know, and we already do that. So, so they've got this self-image of who they think they are and, who, what, and what they want other people to think they are. So what you do, you start collecting the information, the needs, 
linking it to your product and then getting little commitments from them, whether it's imagining what